Spoleto USA 2022 is just around the corner. Today, we take you to their headquarters downtown, just a stone's throw from the Gelliard Center to catch up with the organization's new general director, Mina Mark Hanna. First and foremost, welcome to Charleston, and uh, just wanting to know kind of what your first impressions are of coming from such big cities, big markets, to an intimate one such as Charleston. The last place we lived was Berlin, uh, and Charleston is about you know, as antithetical to Berlin as, as, as one could imagine. Uh, Berlin is kind of like really edgy and kind of grimy and really dark and gray and um, cold. And Charleston is extremely warm and people are really inviting and invitational um, and is much more intimate, although it's still, it's still cosmopolitan. So we're very happy to be here. It, it is, hence Spoleto, it just its very nature, I think, it really puts Charleston on the map to be that cosmopolitan kind of a town. Um, why do you think Charleston makes such a good landing place for the arts? I think it's built into the history of the place. Uh, I mean, this has always been a center of the arts in the United States. Um, you know, the first purpose-built theater was here. The first opera was premiered here, supposedly. Um, there is a long history of the performing arts in Charleston. And I think that's true in port cities, in harbors. Uh, these are generally sort of entry points for different people coming from different places, bringing in different ideas. And Charleston is a melting pot. It, mm -hmm. it was historically, and it continues to be, uh, both a melting pot of past and present and a melting pot of, of different cultures. And if we can talk about the changing of the guard, so you're taking over for Nigel Redden. What was the passing of the torch like? And, and what is it that you feel that you're bringing in, breathing the, the new the new life into Spoleto. I'm coming on the heels of a 35 year tenure leadership of the general director. And I, and I think, you know, a festival is a unique organization. You know, it's incredibly kinetic. There's all this energy. You have all of these different art forms colliding with each other. You have a full year of events compressed into a 17 day delimited period. And there are different art forms. They're just colliding into each other. And I think what Nigel did is that he really reveled in that catalytic collision of these different art forms. What I'm trying to do is build a kind of unity to those forms uh, without that being thematically obvious. Mm -hmm. Just have it feel like there's something unified about it. Um, I know Nigel well. He's been really a curatorial beacon for this country in the performing arts uh, and someone I've always admired. I've always known about the Spoleto Festival and I've always admired his work because he's really the type of, of curator to push the envelope. Yeah, and coming on the heels of lockdowns and COVID and all of that, which really um, ate into just about everything you can think of, but certainly the arts, uh, certainly people going out and seeing entertainment. Uh, what do you think are going to be now the building blocks to getting Spoleto not back to where it was, but even to a higher plane? There are some incredible pieces that were sort of stuck mm -hmm. during the pandemic, like Omar, that was supposed to be premiered in 2020 and was sort of held in a static tank for two years. And its iteration changed, you know, was it going to be a... Uh, a piece that was with social distancing built into it? Was it going to be a piece that was fully digital, so on and so forth? It went through these different iterations. Mm -hmm. And I think now, I'm not quite ex post facto, but I can reflect a little bit. Uh, Omar in 2020 is completely different than Omar in 2022. And that's true of all the performing arts. Mm -hmm. The pandemic has changed constitutionally what we do. And, you know, the social, political, and cultural convulsions of the last two years have changed constitutionally what artists are called to do. Mm -hmm. And I think if you can kind of listen through that din of division and through the cacophonous noise of what is happening in our everyday lives, what you can hear is a cultural renaissance, uh, a real moment in the arts, in the performing arts, in the visual arts, where artists understand how our past bleeds into our present and how we can use that information to imagine a better future.
And I think that's the direction that Spoleto will be in. Well, I think this is a wonderful place to take a break. I just have a few more questions sure. for you after the commercial. So Again. we'll be right back. And we're back with Mina Mark Hanna. He is the new general director for Spoleto USA. And we've been having a wonderful conversation just talking about the arts and just how we're now in a cultural renaissance, which I think is such a beautifully well put statement. I want to talk a little bit about the program this year because it is a lot of arts crammed into a very short window uh, but beginning with that piece de resistance which is Omar mm. and you were saying that the Omar of 2020 is very different from the Omar of 2022 mm. and so maybe you could just um, tell our audience a little bit about uh, what it's what it's about and why it was important to showcase this as the start of Spoleto 2022. Of course. So Omar is an opera written by Rhiannon Giddens and Michael Abels. Rhiannon Giddens is a, um, a multiple Grammy Award winner and MacArthur Genius Grant winner, and Michael Abels is the composer for Jordan Peele's films Get Out. It is an opera based on the life of Omar bin Said, um, who was a West African man that was captured in West Africa um, shipped through the Middle Passage to the United States in the 1820s and sold into bondage here in Charleston, mm. uh, less than a mile away from where this opera will be premiered. And I think that what Omar signifies is a moment of platforming and creating central to our art and discourse the most marginalized voice in American history, that of an enslaved African in the Carolinas. And, and having his words set to the emancipatory power of music to tell us his truth is momentous. I mean, this, it, even the fact that it's an opera mm -hmm. is, is incredible. I mean, opera is an art form that has traditionally been seen as elitist and, and sort of uh, was created in some of the most you know, expensive and ornate holes built in Western Europe. Um, and now what we're doing is we're, we're using opera in its original hybrid form as, as a combination of, of song, of word, of stage, even of dance, to tell a truly moving account and a truthful account mm -hmm. of this enslaved person. But what about the accessibility of the arts to people who cannot necessarily afford tickets mm. to the opera or to the ballet or yeah, well, we're, we're, we're tackling that. We're yeah. going to change that. Um, I think that what these performances do is that they bring public value. And that public value is in pushing back some of the heinous discourse in this country, is in giving another opportunity for people to listen and to understand the other, people to listen and understand those that may be different from them, to have a contrapuntal perspective, to hear one thing, hear another thing, and have both of those perspectives be held at the same time without them canceling each other out. We live in such a binary society where everything is about either this or that. Everything is so oppositional. And the truth is what music, of all things, provides an example for is the multiplicity of voices to create a greater whole. And that's what America is. Mm -hmm. It's a number of different voices creating a beautiful fugue, a greater whole. And that's what I think we're going to aspire to create in the arts here. That's wonderful to hear. Um, as a musician, as a music scholar, as you know, having so much experience of living and performing and studying around the world, uh, do you have any hopes, any goals, any a mission to to then take that those thoughts and and to bring it to the Charleston community, um, to children, to schools, mm -hmm. to exalt the arts whereas they had been cut from programs for years. Do you hope to see, do you endeavor to increase the arts and exposure? There are three simultaneous um, sort of levers to increase access to the arts. The first is to have performers on stage that are more representative of the demographic that we are serving more performers of color, more performers who understand what it means to have a minority perspective. That's the first, and we're doing that in this festival. The second is to create a calendar of events, of production, of events that can go out into the community, outside of the environs of the peninsula, 
to serve the greater Charleston region, to actually show the people that we wish to serve what we are trying to create through arts and, and display the majesty and magic of theater mm -hmm. and then give them a peek behind the curtain to see how it's done. And that's gonna be done really with an aim to focus on fostering emerging talent mm -hmm. and fostering creative thought. And then the third, is to lower the barrier to access for the value year round. It's wonderful to hear that and I appreciate it. You know, we, of course we've got Halo, Pure Theater, Charleston Stage, uh, various organizations that are doing that in a grassroots way, but I think certainly with your leadership, we can see that happening more and more in the years to come. It's been such a pleasure to talk with you, Mina. Thank, Thank you so you. much for taking the time. Thank you, Leila. We're back after this.